task here is to basically give you the landscape of what Rad X is all about. Um, and I will therefore not say a whole lot about the specifics of your program. I will leave that to the following presenters to sort of uh, take off the layers of the onion here and help identify how this program, which we're very excited about, fits within that context uh, of a larger effort in Rad X. So if I could have the next slide, please. RADx has these various components, um, and I'm going to briefly tell you about each of them, even though the one in the blue box uh, is the one that you're particularly here to be involved in and to hear more about. Uh, you can see each of these listed here uh, even has dollar figures, and those are substantial dollar figures, and this has been possible because the Congress of the United States, seeing the impact uh, of COVID-19, across the world and across the country, asked NIH uh, to get involved in a very big way, particularly to try uh, to develop as rapidly as possible diagnostic technologies to identify who is actually infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 in order to quickly identify ways uh, to help them and also to keep them from infecting others. At the time this funding was provided, uh, which was the end of April uh, 2020, uh, the kinds of diagnostic tests that were available were pretty limited, almost all done in big box laboratories, which required obtaining samples, uh, sending them off, hoping to get a result back quickly, but oftentimes that stretched into several days, missing the opportunity, therefore, for the kind of quick turnaround results that we all realized were going to be important in the presence of this pandemic, especially since it was so readily spread by people who had little or no symptoms. So we took those funds and we looked very carefully at what the opportunities might be. And with my colleagues, uh, many of them across NIH, ended up designing this program called RADx, Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics, uh, with the pieces and parts that you see here. Um, I will say something about each one of them individually, but you can read the words on this slide uh, describing what they are. A RADx tech, particularly, as the name suggests, uh, identifying new technologies to do testing. I'll come back to RADx UP in a minute. A RADx RAD, looking at sort of across the horizon at whether there are even more radical approaches to testing, which might not immediately produce workable uh, tools for this, but could in the long run be transformative. RADx ATP kind of linked up with RADx tech but uh, identified things that were a little closer to the clinic, sort of advanced. We of course needed to have data management support and we needed to have uh, more recently an opportunity to test out a particular technology, namely at home testing, uh, use, utilizing antigens, which are going to be part of what you all talk about today uh, with the RADx back to school program. But RADx UP uh, from the very beginning uh, was clear to us as a component that we really needed to invest in, given that communities that had been hit hard with COVID-19 uh, were also often communities where testing was not very accessible, further compounding uh, the way in which the pandemic uh, was progressing. So that's what RADx UP's goals were, and there are many components of it that I'll tell you about in a moment. Next slide, please. Again, RADx Tech aimed to try to, as rapidly as possible, develop new platforms for being able to do testing, ideally at the point of care and maybe even over the counter or with in-home testing. And as time went on, many of the platforms that we invested in achieved those goals all the way to the point of getting emergency use authorization by FDA and getting distributed to the community. Next slide. RADx ATP, as I mentioned, was a partner with RADx Tech, but particularly identified those technologies that were even a little closer to the clinic, but needed a big push uh, to get all the way there in terms of support for FDA approval, in terms of manufacturing, dealing with supply chains, all of the things that are necessary if you're going to try to get a new technology out there uh, to the point of doing perhaps hundreds of thousands of tests a day. Next slide. The way in which RADx Tech and RADx ATP operated 
utilized what we could call an innovation funnel that you see diagrammed here. Uh, basically, within five days after receiving the congressional appropriation, uh, we opened up the opportunity for those inventors who had come up with new ideas about how to do viral detection to come forward with those plans, initially in a rather brief and, and uh, high level discussion. And then those were reviewed and depending on the uh, likelihood of success, offered the chance uh, to go to the next phase of this innovation funnel. Uh, and it got to be pretty busy. Uh, <laughs> we had almost 3,000 applications that got started, not all of which got finished, but if you look at phase zero, which we also affectionately called the shark tank, there were 716 uh, that got put into this potential uh, uh, place for phase zero, and 142 were chosen. Basically, those 142 projects uh, were intensely reviewed, many hours of experts from business, from engineering, from technology, from manufacturing, from supply chain, all of those issues uh, to see whether that platform had potential. If they passed that particular gate, uh, then they went on to phase one, 47 got there. Phase two ultimately was at the point where you had regulatory approval and scale up. And with the tests being produced, uh, now contributing over 3 million tests a day, a substantial fraction of the total that's now happening in the US as a result of this RADx program. You can see the footnote at the bottom that we reopened the funnel in June uh, because there was a continuing interest in this and also uh, some additional funds provided uh, by the Congress. And so we have another bunch that are coming through uh, to see what else is there with new ideas, some of which are really quite bold and will add to our capabilities uh, to do this. Next slide. And if you look at the contribution of those testing platforms provided by RADx support, uh, you can see that that has bounced up to the point of over 3 million tests per day uh, to our national capacity as of May. Next slide. But we're here today particularly to talk about RADx UP as in underserved populations. Again, the goal being to enhance testing amongst those populations across the US by developing a consortium of community engaged research projects that can implement those testing interventions and see how they work. And that meant also in the process of that strengthening data on disparities in infection rates and identifying ways to reduce these disparities, which has included, of course, dealing with the issue of vaccine hesitancy. Uh, you can see from the diagram at the bottom uh, that this has been rolled out in two phases. Uh, phase one accomplished fairly quickly after receiving the funding. This is all done by the kind of funding mechanism that allows NIH uh, to move much faster than we normally would in a typical uh, grant review process, uh, building infrastructure, implementing testing, other capabilities. And we're now in phase two. Uh, which is very much the part that you are part of, and you'll hear more about that here uh, shortly when I finish uh, from Elizeo and Richard. Next slide. I mentioned RADx RAD. This is the opportunity to make sure we're not missing even newer and even bolder ideas just coming over the horizon that might make it possible to do viral detection at an even more um, powerful approach. You can see some examples uh, that are there uh, in terms of the kinds of things that we're looking at in RADx RAD, even including something like a breath test that might be able to, uh, by looking at various molecules that are present in expired air, uh, identify the presence of the virus and could be done therefore in seconds in places where you'd really like to have that. Imagine if that was working, how that would affect our ability uh, to do monitoring uh, in various settings, including schools. Uh, those tests will probably be a little while longer coming, but we're investing in them as fast as we can. Next slide. For all this to work, it's gotta be coordinated. And so we are determined uh, to invest appropriately in three different centers uh, that you can see listed here and the stars tell you where they are. 
a data consortium coordination center and program organization effort at UC San Diego, uh, the Consortium for Improving Medicine with Innovation and Technology Summit, which is a big part of our RADx tech and RADx uh, ATP program, and then the Coordination and Data Collection Center, uh, represented very much at this meeting by uh, Warren Kibbe and others, uh, the CDCC at Duke, UNC, and Durham. Next slide. We are determined uh, to make the most of this program in terms of effective data management, not to have this be an afterthought, but to have it be built into the design from the beginning to have platforms that can integrate the data on individuals and populations uh, to make sure that we are doing everything we can for curation and harmonization, uh, such things as common data elements uh, being considered. So that will be also a part of your conversation today to be sure that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and that's reflected in the way in which we do data management. Next slide. So I think with that, I will say thank you to all of you. And it's great to pull this team together. Uh, the programs that are funded here, I've looked at the brief descriptions. It looks like a wonderfully diverse set of investigators and teams and geographic locations and populations and ideas about how you're gonna proceed. I think we're gonna learn a lot. No doubt we will all learn a lot from each other, which is why we wanted to pull everybody together. Wish we could do this in the same room with a lot of whiteboards around. But we're doing what we can uh, with the current circumstances in the world of Zoom. So thank you for being part of this. And with that, I will turn this back over uh, to Eliseo perez and Richard Hodes, who have worked hard uh, to get us to this point and to whom I want to express my gratitude. Richard and Eliseo. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, and we will now take us through the more detailed presentation of RADx UP program. And I'll get us started, and then Richard will pick up about halfway through. We can go through the next slide. So you heard the overall uh, RADx uh, plan and history. Uh, I do want to emphasize that uh, Congress, in their foresight, did not uh, say, "Well." definitely allocate funds for underserved populations. This was a, a nice director decision uh, at the time uh, as we saw where the pandemic was heading and the kind of impact it had had on working people and especially communities of color. Uh, and so I, I do think that uh, this was a, a tremendous opportunity for us to not only uh, make a difference, but also advance science uh, in health disparities research. Um, so expanding testing broadly uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 in these highly affected populations, including asymptomatic persons. Uh, when we launched this program, remember we had vaccines were still being looked at for possible for clinical trials and we're at a much different place now a year later. Um, to deploy validated point of care tests as they became available. And we are only uh, really allowing our uh, our projects to use um, FDA uh, e, uh, tests that have been uh, received emergency use authorization. Uh, we're not, uh, or oh, we have a great test developed by our local lab that we're not letting that happen. We need to stick with um, FDA EUA. And there are a number of other factors behind that um, because we are interested in, in return of results and in having uh, data quality across the program. So far we have we're close to having achieved that with all of the currently funded projects, but will include self-testing and saliva test methods. Uh, these mitigation strategies that we uh, solely depended on until December uh, continue to be relevant, um, perhaps uh, strict uh, sheltering at home or self-isolation uh, is less practical now than, than ever before given what's happened, uh, but clearly wearing masks in uh, most indoor places, if not all indoor places uh, that are public, um, it continues to be a, a very relevant uh, intervention, particularly for unimmunized individuals. But I would, I would argue for all, if you're in a, in a place where you don't know all the people there are already vaccinated. And we know that it's, it's a mandated for uh, healthcare settings and uh, public transportation. So understanding uh, how we can limit this community transmission is critical. 
Uh, all these factors that contribute to disparities uh, are not something that Rad XUP can resolve. We can't resolve crowded housing, uh, lack of jobs, uh, inability to self-isolate, or, or even, even if you are feeling ill within a household uh, or densely populated communities or other structural issues that we know have existed for decades. Uh, but I think that the, the pandemic revealed how these factors play into causing, um, uh, well, morbidity and mortality uh, from COVID-19. And I think understanding that better will inform us in how we approach other pandemics uh, that are more chronic diseases in the US. Um, and then establishing an infrastructure uh, that could really facilitate this evaluation and distribution of vaccines and therapeutics. Um, I, I look at the CDCC as, as a, a huge investment. Part of the NIMHD uh, is, is housing the CDCC. We, we've been very happy with uh, the work uh, of the Coordinating Center to date. Um, uh, my own uh, as, a, as a smaller institute working with large institute, NIA, and also with NICHD now uh, very closely uh, with all the staff, the NIH staff really dedicated to this effort uh, with enormous uh, passion and energy. Next slide. You uh, have a snapshot here of the 69 funded research projects in coordination and data collection center. You already know that that's in North Carolina. Um, I think we have a fairly good distribution uh, geographically. We have some holes that are partially can be addressed perhaps in phase two as we see the applications come in. Uh, we have a number that are covering tribal nations, uh, including uh, a couple of grants that are funded in states like California and Massachusetts, but are really focused on South Dakota uh, and Navajo Nation in the Southwest. Uh, you can see the populations with health disparities distribution here. We're following the NIH definition of uh, populations with health disparities, so all racial ethnic groups, including Asian Americans, uh, Blacks, African Americans, Hispanic Latinos, American Indians, uh, and then sexual and gender minorities, as well as poor people of any color, and then underserved rural populations. And we look at these and say, well, where do we have some gaps perhaps for phase two? And, and we certainly are, are considering those as we move forward. We can see perhaps in rural areas, we didn't have as many uh, sites as we would have liked. Um, next slide. Um, the 70 includes the CDCC or Coordination Center. And then this is uh, cutting it through the vulnerable population projects lens. So uh, the other is disparity populations. This is additional categories of which, as you know, you, you can imagine have a huge amount of intersectionality and overlap. Um, and uh, they're not mutually exclusive, uh, any of these charts. So you see multiple, multiple uh, projects are focused on multiple different populations. Um, medical comorbidities is particularly relevant. As uh, we know, it, there is increased mortality and severe morbidity in individuals infected with COVID-19 and comorbidity. The remoteness of rural areas is important to address. Migrant and immigrant populations, of course, are potentially more susceptible, co-infected with other chronic infections such as HIV or tuberculosis and uh, migratory. So could easily then promote spread of HIV. And again, are often rural based and uh, harder to, um, to access with uh, technology. Uh, individuals with substance use disorders or severe, especially severe mental illness, uh, all essential workers, uh, disproportionately, again, represented by uh, the racial ethnic minority groups, particularly Latinos, Hispanics, and African-Americans, um, community dwelling older adults. Fortunately, we've seen uh, embracing um, uh, vaccination. So uh, the questions here may, may, may be slightly different now uh, with uh, over 80%, I believe, of uh, persons over 65 now vaccinated, where 80% of all mortality took place pre-vaccine, uh, and that's changing. Children, adolescents, that's what we're about. Public housing residents, again, a setting where I think some innovative projects have been uh, implemented. And I mentioned before, um, American Indians, not just the residents of tribal lands or surrounding or reservations or surrounding areas, but also urban Indians included in our projects. Next slide. Um, additional uh, target uh, vulnerable populations include the homeless, uh, again, as you can imagine, 
uh, challenge to always uh, access for healthcare and potentially for testing uh, or vaccination. Uh, communities exposed to high rates of air pollution, there's good empirical information that uh, this uh, increases, increased air pollution does increase your chance of respiratory infection, um, your risk of respiratory infection. Of course, many of these urban communities with high rates of air pollution are, are uh, often uh, poor or communities of color. And again, areas that in this, the schools are in those lo located in those areas as well. Past history of uh, uh, being engaged in a negative way with the criminal justice system or the juvenile justice system, currently pregnant or soon to be pregnant. Uh, we've learned women who are pregnant who get infected with COVID-19 have uh, exacerbations and challenges uh, during pregnancy and giving birth. And sort of following this group has been uh, one of the priorities in, uh, in some of the social behavioral efforts NIH has launched in addition to the RADx UP. Um, people are living in crowded housing and uh, individuals with disabilities in cognitive impairment or dementia, not as many projects here, although I, I, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you'll hear from Allison, a, a couple of important return to school projects were funded uh, with, uh, with population of children with disabilities and residents of nursing homes and assisted living. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are the testing participant locations. I think this captures the additional areas of the country that are included that are not necessarily funded uh, with a particular site. Uh, do notice that we do have Alaska and Hawaii included here, Puerto Rico as well. Uh, so we were really able to expand time zones, if you wish. Uh, but there are some holes uh, that we can see in the southeast, uh, as well as in the upper uh, out west. And these are areas, again, that we'll be paying attention to. Uh, and some also in New England, in the more rural uh, parts of New England, Maine and Vermont in particular. Next slide. These are the uh, phase one awards for the social, ethical, and behavioral implications. This was a component of RADx UP where we funded more traditional research projects. So they're not charged with uh, doing testing. Um, and this is their distribution. Uh, and uh, they're smaller awards, uh, and these are also being uh, managed both for common data elements and for data sharing uh, through uh, our uh, CDCC um, uh, uh, program. Next slide. And I think I turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Richard Hodes, Director of the National Institute on Aging. Richard? Thank, thank you, Elsa. Well, thank you, Francis, for the leadership and LSAO for uh, being a, a partner for the last year plus uh, through these initiatives. Um, I'll outline for you the, the programs that compose RADx UP. Um, when we began a little over a year ago to look at ways in which we could fund research that would target populations vulnerable and at risk, as LSAO was elaborated upon, uh, we had our initial two solicitations in a couple of categories. This was the first of them which targeted large networks, consortia, and research centers that already existed and had established relationships with populations. These awards, therefore, were larger. They were $5 million per site over two years, and some 30 sites were funded. These were, again, organizations which had a history of and were committed to continuing close partnership with communities, provided large-scale testing and resources. Uh, the total calculated of the number of participants or tests over this program was estimated to be at 500,000 which at that time was a very large number and still a very critical number in, in driving our implementation into targeted populations. Uh, various methods, point of care, pool and lab tests, PCR, most of which were just barely being conceived of at the time these programs began. And the next slide, please. A partner initiative uh, was one which was targeted at uh, any of the NIH supported uh, research entities, which did not necessarily have fully established the relationships with communities that allowed a quick start, but nonetheless allowed us to expand into greater number of investigators, institutions, geographic and population diversities. So these awards, $2 million per site over two years from another 23 sites, carry out very much the same area, but enhanced together with the large and established centers, relationships with communities and populations, to better understand testing, the challenge of testing in communities. At that point, you remember that contact tracing was critical, uh, modulation uh, by 
behavioral interventions at a time when we were just very beginning to hope that we might have a vaccine in sight. Uh, these awards then were over 23 sites, uh, some in, in FY20 and then in FY21, an additional number as some of these organizations came online, more time needed for planning than some of that first initiative, which were pre-established relationships. And the next slide, please. Uh, Alceo alluded to the social, ethical, and behavioral implications. Uh, these were studies which were not designed so much as to perform directly the outreach and testing, but to analyze the implications, historical, healthcare, social, economic, around testing and the cultural beliefs impacts that it might have, which were informing the whole of the um, initiative and five projects in 2011 and FY21 through this effort. Next slide, please. And importantly, a coordinating center, you heard that referred to, this is one, the CDCC, which serves right XUP, a substantial investment, $80 million over four years, but critical to bring together the large number of organizations, entities, and populations to assure a place where lessons could be learned and shared, to harmonize data, to monitor and integrate common data elements across the many areas. Enormously successful so far, as you know, awarded to Duke and UNC, which has been our vehicle, we from NIH, with the various communities and awardees to work and integrate to maximal efficiency this work through hub and spoke, an important part of the data management that Francis alluded to in the introduction. Next slide, please. And just to introduce in this final slide, the phase two, new funding opportunities, things have changed enormously from when the early uh, initiatives that we just spoke of came to be in very large and important measure because of the vaccines availability during this year, questions of vaccine hesitancy, testing of interventions uh, along with the testing process itself. So you can see here a program of administrative supplements. That's the awards that were already made in RADx UP, the first phase. Supplements to address now testing in the context of vaccines, particularly the challenge still to this day, certainly of vaccine resistance or hesitancy. Competitive revisions for any NIH awards that allowed existing research to supplement itself to test interventions, again, in an environment of vaccine availability. And then an RFA for uh, U01's testing and vaccination, new awards to be given out. Uh, these just with a receipt ap application just this very month, and the same for an expanded set of the SEBI initiative as we mentioned. So this is what's to come. It's the next phase of RADx UP. Uh, it's been a challenge and a, and a, and a shared uh, pleasure to work with, with all of you uh, quite remarkable as the field has changed from mitigation that was based solely on isolation, then to prevention, vaccines, uh, all as we learn more and more about the importance of addressing health disparities. Uh, it's been exciting to date with more to promise. Uh, it's been a pleasure for all of us, speaking for myself, LSA, and all of us at NIH to be working with all of you. And I think this passes it on to the next phase of our, our meeting. Thank you. Go ahead, Allison. You, you... Thanks, Alceo. Um, I, uh, this is Alison Cernich. I'm the Deputy Director of NICHD, and I recognize we have about five minutes to keep ourselves on schedule, so I wanted to uh, make sure that we had time for the investigators to give us the overview of what they're planning, um, and one to thank um, both Dr. Collins, uh, Dr. Pro Sable, um, as well as Dr. Hodas for their incredible support. Um, as well as the team from NICHD, as well as the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, which has provided critical uh, support for us with respect to the OT management. Um, and, and our colleagues from that institute are so valuable to this program. Um, and also thanks to the investigators who are here today. Um, this is a new program um, that we are doing um, using other transaction authority, which many of you have probably not used before. Um, and we had neither. So thank you for being part of this experiment with us. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, what this really gives us the flexibility to do is negotiate sort of how we are going to manage and then how we can adapt um, as the pandemic changes. As many of you are aware, um, and I'll just mention this, that as we're looking at the new variants emerging, especially the Delta variant and reports out of the UK um, where they are in school, uh, we are concerned that there are some things coming to us 
um, as we face the new school year. And so our phase one awards, which we'll talk about in a minute, will maybe give us some guidance, um, but we also need to be prepared to be able to pivot. And that's what this mechanism really allows us to do. So next slide, please. As you all probably are very well aware, the goal here was to develop and test COVID-19 diagnostic testing approaches to safely return children and staff to the in-person school setting. Um, and again, we use the other transaction authority. Um, this was a $50 million commitment from the OD Congressional Appropriation for RADx. And I also wanna thank the OD because they um, and um, Dr. Prestable and, and Dr. Hodes also supported additional funding. So we are making some additional awards to expand the schools that we are um, doing investigations on. Next slide, please. Um, we, in our first phase, phase one, awarded $33 million um, for eight sites. Uh, the focus was really, uh, at that point, uh, on folks that were not eligible for our vaccine, so under age 16, which we now know we have 12 to 16-year-olds uh, uh, able to be vaccinated in all school personnel, um, looking at methods to integrate testing in return to our maintenance of in-person instruction, and looking at effective, scalable, and sustaining sustainable implementation. Um, and so this is really uh, moving very quickly. All of these projects are testing. Um, they tested during the spring and they're also testing in summer sessions. Um, we will be having a workshop on August 9th um, to update the findings from that phase one awards, um, what we've known so far, and you all have already been invited to that. Next slide, please. So phase two, which is what you all are a part of, we had about $15 million awarded here to five sites. And again, uh, there were some updates, right? So under age 12, um, but again, still looking at some of the same things in terms of return to or maintenance of in-person instruction um, and scalable and sustainable methods for implementation. Um, and really what we are trying to do is build the evidence to underline what's going to be effective to get schools back operational with kids and staff safe. Uh, we do have three additional awards and negotiations, and we will update folks on those when we do our workshop in August. Next slide, please. So as of right now, here are the sites um, and their distribution. We actually have a really nice uh, geographic coverage, though. Um, obviously, we would love to do a little bit more in the Midwest um, and in the Southeast, but um, the institution cities are as listed. Um, and we want to wake, welcome you all to the uh, team that's tackling this across the country. Next slide, please. As far as the distribution, we are looking at this in terms of the distribution across the types of schools we're investigating. Um, so we are looking at middle schools, public schools, high schools, elementary schools, right? So all phases of education, including early child, childhood education. We're looking at charter schools as well. Um, we do have two programs looking at um, implementation of testing in special education settings. This is particularly important from the perspective that many of these children cannot do some of the regularly suggested mitigation strategies. Um, we also have one site really looking at medically complicated children um, who are going to be in the school setting who, again, may not have special education needs but have special medical needs that prohibit them from mitigating. Uh, we also have uh, sites in tribal schools. Next slide, please. And the age distribution, as you might imagine, we have a fair concentration in children and adolescents, six to 17 years of age. Um, and then we do have some that are concentrated um, in specific age groups, including in this phase an early childhood education site and also sites looking at homeless youth and migrant youth. Um, and so we really are excited to see this distribution because it covers a wide variety uh, of diverse populations in terms of age and special needs. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing in terms of education, well, we already did this one. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so I'm going to now turn it over to um, Dr. Sonia Lee, who will lead us through the investigator um, presentations. And I want to thank both she um, and Chris Lindsay, as well as our colleague Neil Perkins from the intramural setting. They have really done a lot of the programmatic work here. And I know Sonia and Chris have been in all the negotiating me meetings with you um, and have really provided a lot of scientific leadership. Um, I want to thank them for all that they're doing, as well as our, our team that has been doing the OT management. Uh, I know you all have all become fast friends, uh, so you know Sonia well, and she almost needs no introduction. But Sonia, I will turn it over to you. 
Thanks so much, Allison. And I, I wanted to also extend my thanks for the leadership from Dr. Prestadley and Dr. Hodes, but especially the, the leadership and the unwavering support from Dr. Cernich and the NICHD director, Dr. Um, Diana Bianchi. So it's been um, quite the whirlwind to get to this point, but I'm so pleased to be able to have the investigators be able to present their work that they're going to be doing over the next couple of years and really thank them for their responsiveness to the NIH RAD XUP return to school program, but above all your responsiveness and your engagement with your communities and your schools that you'll be working with. So really looking forward to the rest of the afternoon. Logistically uh, for folks, if you have questions and comments, we are going to hold them until the end of all of the presentations, as well as holding your virtual applause after the presentations as well. But if you do have things that you want to uh, put in the chat, please feel free to do so and we will do our best to address them at the end. Um, and with that, uh, next slide please. I would like to go ahead and introduce our first presenter, Sir Dr. Lisa Gwynn from the University of Miami School of Medicine. So Lisa. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Lisa, and um, we will be advancing your slide centrally. So um, take it away. Thank you so much, Sonia. It's a thrill to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to not only sharing what we will be doing, but looking forward to learning from others as well. So next slide. So the, the title of our project is Maximizing Child Health and Learning Potential, Promoting a School Culture of Safety in the Era of COVID-19. And we are a team from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Um, we are also in partnership um, with the Children's Trust, which is a, a local um, not-for-profit tax-funded organization that actually funds our school clinics, as well as the Dr. Do John T. McDonald Foundation, who also funds um, our school clinics. Next slide. So our team, our primary team consists of myself. I'm a, a general pediatrician. Um, and my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Polgrone, who is a uh, pediatric clinical psychologist, as well as Dr. Viviana Horizian, who is a physician scientist, and our project manager, uh, Maria Ferraris. Next slide. And we also have a robust team uh, that uh, is currently employed in the um, school clinics with us. Um, some we will be adding um, additional sprinkled um, staff members in with our um, existing team, which currently consists of a social worker. Um, we have a psychologist who is also a um, science-based science, science psychologist. We will be hiring two postdoc fellows uh, in psychology as well as interns. And of course we have um, a project manager and research assistants that will be joining us, as well as our school nurses in the clinics on the front lines. Next slide. So a little bit about our program. Our official title is the Dr. John T. McDonald Foundation School Health Initiative. Uh, we are housed in the, um, the Miami-Dade County Public School District, which is the largest school district in Florida and the fourth, fourth largest in the country. I, um, the foundation uh, school initiative was started in the year 2000, so we've been around for quite some time, and we provide comprehensive healthcare services in schools in Miami-Dade County. Um, these include three high schools, we have two middle schools, we have four elementary schools, and all are considered Title I um, schools, and they 94% uh, of those students in within those schools um, qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, we have in our network of uh, about 10,000 kids in our schools. Um, and in our model of care, we have a, a blend. Some of our schools have full service clinics, which have exam rooms, waiting rooms, um, laboratories. So we are a full um, health suite. Um, we have full pediatric services within those sites. We also have um, health suites in some of our elementary schools and one of our middle, middle schools. And those are basically a, a much smaller room, which most people envision as a school health suite and it's just with uh, housed with one LPN and they manage all of the health needs of the students in those small health suites. The nice thing is we do have um, telehealth equipment and so our team is very interconnected. 
So if a child comes into these health suites and needs to see a pediatrician, they are um, connected uh, with the pediatricians at our, our main hub sites. And so they're able to, um, to access um, providers very, very quickly. Our staff consists of pediatricians. We also have pediatric residents that come through our program. Um, we have APRNs. Um, we also have nursing students and our clinics themselves are um, staffed with either RN or LPN level um, nurse providers. And so in addition to um, all of our clinical services, which include well visits, sports physicals, we of course administer immunizations. Um, we we're responsible for all of the health, um, the mandated health screenings for uh, that is mandated through the state. Um, and so we do all of the um, vision and hearing screenings and other school health related services. We also have a very robust mental health program um, and that's uh, Dr. Polgarone leads that team and they provide um, additional screening um, through, of mental health disorders. And they also provide on-site um, clinical um, therapies. And we also have re reproductive health services um, and we are a part of, um, we are contracted with the local Department of Health to provide STI and HIV testing. Next slide. So I want to also mention, because there is an arm to our study that includes our pediatric community pediatrics programs, um, one of which is the pediatric mobile clinic, which I lead um, as well. And that program started back in 1992 as a result of Hurricane Andrew, and it has gone on providing um, comprehensive health care services and immunizations to uninsured kids throughout Miami-Dade County. Um, in addition, our another program of ours that we just launched um, earlier this year called Shots to Go, it's a second unit that is exclusively dedicated to providing immunizations to um, not only at health fairs and different community events, but we also partner with the school district to provide immunizations to um, schools that have low compliance rates. And then lastly, we have a, a, a COVID-19 testing team. So since um, last year, we have been testing kids throughout Miami-Dade County. Uh, we've tested over 15,000 kids out in the community. And, and so that is gonna be a piece um, of our project that uh, we will be partnering with as well. Next slide. And so our, our um, RADx up project um, consists of three studies. Our first study is really focusing on um, gathering information, um, whether it's conducting um, um, information from focus groups, and I'll get into a little bit more of the detail, but basically we're gonna look, we're gonna interview key stakeholders within schools and communities to just get a better understanding of um, COVID-19 knowledge. Um, we wanna hear about cultural differences because our community um, in Miami-Dade is extremely diverse. Um, many languages, languages are spoken, um, cultural norms are very different depending on what neighborhood you're in, which is something we've learned very, very um, extensively through our mobile clinic programs. Um, the other piece to this that is a really big deal for our, our parents is, is stigma and discrimination. Again, cultural norms um, play a big role in um, how families feel about COVID-19 and the stigma that oftentimes is associated with it in underserved populations. And of course, lastly, which we feel is probably the most important thing right now is, is maximizing trust and confidence um, in not only the healthcare that we're providing in the schools, such as testing, but also vaccination and understanding um, vaccination confidence and hesitancy. So, in study one, it's more of information gathering, and we will be doing this through conducting online surveys. We will also be conducting focus groups. Um, parents and staff um, will all be engaged, as well as school personnel and, and administration. And thankfully, we've been embedded in the schools for a long time. 
I serve on the, um, the superintendent's medical advisory board. We're in just about daily communication with our comprehensive health services for the school district, as well as the Department of Health. So we feel in a very good um, position to be able to gain all the information that we need um, from stakeholders to move forward. Next slide. And so another piece to the first study and in gathering information is we are going to form um, an advisory board consisting of one of our local uh, um, university pediatric infectious disease specialists, um, as well as other um, key people within the school culture, such as um, parent representatives, school leadership. Um, we're also going to choose um, a, a few, a couple, two to three school champions who will, will be people that work within the schools. It could be the cafeteria manager, it could be the head custodian, it could be a coach where each school, we're gonna choose um, school champions that will work with our team, our advisory board, to just give us you know, information and feedback on the front lines of what's working and what's not working. And we will meet with them on a regular basis. Um, okay, next slide. So study two focuses more on the actual testing protocols within the school clinics. And so that's what we're gonna be focusing on. Um, our goal of course is to um, do our best to offer testing services every single day in our school clinics and work with the school district to identify the best approaches for appropriate protocols that will ensure that kids can get back in school as soon as possible. I mean, so we are gonna be um, creating protocols that um, will be used for kids that are symptomatic that come into our clinics, as well as asymptomatic or just exposed from a classroom exposure. And so we will have um, control schools, which will not receive any type of testing services offered. And then the intervention schools that we've selected will in fact get this full complement of testing. Uh, we are also going to work with the athletic teams to develop the best, um, best strategies on testing of the athletes, um, whether pooling is feasible, whether just individualized rapid testing is feasible. We are going to use the Binax Now rapid tests as well as the Q tests um, for co confirmatory um, tests. And I think that's it. Next slide. And finally, study three, we will take all of this information that we've gathered from um, study one regarding um, vaccine knowledge and hesitancy, and we will create a health education and vac uh, vaccination um, confidence initiative. So we will um, implement this, and we will also, in the process, um, offer COVID vaccine um, to the schools through our clinic nurses as well as through our mobile units which will come in and provide um, free COVID vaccination to all of um, the students and the the school staff and personnel and we're hoping that our interventions will um, make a difference in the uptake of um, not only vaccine confidence but actually receiving the vaccine next slide and that's it thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Gwynn. I, I do so appreciate not only the level of community engagement um, that, that you presented today, but also the, the thought that it's vaccine confidence that we have to think about. We had talked about this before um, and really instilling that through your champions, I think will be interesting to see that progress. So thanks so much, uh, Lisa. Thank you. So next slide, please. I'd like to introduce Dr. Mara Inkeles from the University of California, Los Angeles. So Mara. Thank you so much. I'm very pleased to introduce our project in context on behalf of our research team and, uh, and school system partner. Um, the, as you can see on the next slide, the, the title of our project is the impact of COVID-19 testing and mitigation on equitable return to school in the, in the second largest US school district. Um, next slide, please. 
So Los Angeles Unified School District is our major district partner, and it's an expansive district. Um, most of the students are econo economically disadvantaged, and the student population is primarily Latino with additional sizable subgroups. There are additional subgroups that are not listed here that, while small percentage-wise, given LA Unified size, are actually um, large enough for, um, for deeper uh, analysis as, as needed. The pandemic's impact on in-person learning is particularly significant in LA Unified. Just as an example, after schools closed in March 2020, about 60% of Latino and African-American um, students in middle school participated regularly in the online instruction compared to about 80% of white, Asian, and multiracial peers. Um, and nearly all LA Unified students have learned remotely for more than 20, 12 months at this point. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this research uh, uh, project evolved from a collaboration that was forged between our NIH funded clinical and translational science institute and LA Unified about a year ago when they sought our technical expertise on testing platforms that they were considering and to provide them interpretation of evolving science as they sought um, safer reopening. Um, so our research team developed a model to help them visualize the infection dynamics in response to the questions that they were asking about the value and impact of different testing schemes and just what to anticipate with the goal of safer reopening. Um, so together we identified outcomes of interest and the goal was to provide them with insight in, into how decisions they might make could affect outcomes that they cared about. Um, so we built in flexible parameters and enabled them to enter their own values as, as things changed neighborhood prevalence, properties of tests, the schemes they used, other things. We made that model available online for ongoing use. There's a link here. And I mentioned this because it reflects our Radix Up project appreciation that the pandemic is evolving and the district questions may evolve as we progress as they just have over the past couple of weeks with the Delta variant. Um, next slide, please. Um, so just in terms of the features of the district's uh, testing program, testing was a priority of parents when they were surveyed in, this, in the summer of 2020 regarding um, their perceptions of what would constitute safer return. And in October 2020, the district secured capacity for 20,000 tests per day. Um, so based on thinking through the, the dynamics and, and how people might behave um, when, when schools reopened, some of the features of the testing program included access for household members in addition to students and staff, um, free testing and testing on school campuses to be as inviting uh, as possible. So it's an example of learning from, I think, what was coming out of the NIH and some of the early um, funded projects in terms of the social and behavioral considerations regarding COVID testing. Um, the district, uh, in terms of the program, the district contract traces um, school contacts of any positive cases and collaborates with our county department of public health to investigate any possible epi linkage of cases as they're identified. Next slide, please. Just want to show that the district has a number of dashboards that show the volume and results of tests. Um, the uh, number of epi linkages as they occur, and at the district level, information about vaccine coverage as well. The public version of this dashboard enables anyone to see cases and any secondary infection incidents by school over a uh, prior seven or 14 day period, and those refresh daily. Um, the cases are available by uh, grade level, although, although not by actual um, class. The next slide, please. As you can see from, um, from this chart, the, the district did begin testing in October 2020, even though schools were, were not um, open uh, for an extended period due to public health um, measures in California and Los Angeles County. Um, this chart shows test positivity as well as the weekly test volumes um, since October. Um, and there were both some staff uh, who were on campus uh, teaching their Zoom class from, from campus to make things easier. Some of their children, the teachers' uh, children were on campus to make it easier for them to teach. And there were some students receiving one-on-one -on -one in special education receiving one-on-one -on -one, um, tutoring. So they were, um, they were availed of, of routine testing during that time, a small number. Um, you can see that high positivity occurred during the surge and the volume during that time was, again, these, these um, selected individuals. Um, the schools opened about seven weeks before the end of the 2020, 2021 school year and there was a baseline test before returning and then weekly testing at this point. So that's why you see on the right-hand part of the chart, um, the, the volume increasing for um, household members, students and, and staff. 
Um, next slide, please. So our, our research aims are threefold. The first is to understand how the, the, unique, um, the unique scope and uh, at, uh, reach of the LEN fights COVID-19 surveillance testing um, influences secondary infection, as well as school enrollment and school attendance, and how it influences disparities in these outcomes that are associated with geography and student characteristics, um, such as poverty, as well as others. The second aim, and I should say this is a collaborative aim with one of the other RADx uh, phase one sites in North Carolina that has some surveillance testing um, and also has uh, schools that do not have surveillance testing so that we can both observe what happens um, with surveillance testing as LE Unified predictably changes the periodicity or other aspects of the scheme and also compare it to a place that doesn't have uh, surveillance testing to see what, what we can learn through that collaboration. The second aim is uh, primarily qualitative, which is to uh, study how the surveillance testing influences um, overall parent perceptions of safety as well as disparities. Um, and that includes their perceptions, decisions to return in person and, and daily attendance once that decision is made one way or the other. And then the third aim is to um, try to use the information for immediate impact since the pandemic is, is affecting the district in a major way right now um, to explore use of targeted um, and responsive health education um, through a technology platform to, to address some of the parent information gaps that come out of the, the research. Um, next slide, please. Just wanted to give an example of um, how within the analysis we'll be studying variations since we do anticipate differences across the catchment area of this vast um, area. So cases and deaths, as you see here, vary considerably across neighborhoods within the LA Unified catchment. And as displayed here, vaccination patterns have varied quite a bit. These are charts showing um, a cumulative vaccination coverage since between December 2020 and, and current day. Um, these patterns vary quite a bit. Um, and they give some insight into community behavior that helps us hypothesize and, and analyze and, and interpret the data. Next slide, please. Um, here's another example of how we'll use analysis of variation to understand the potential influence of various factors on outcomes. Here, for example, you can see that the district saw quite a bit of variation by grade level just in the brief part of the last school year where in-person learning became an option. And there's also a chart here that shows variation, for example, in sixth grade um, uh, percent of students in middle school who elected in-person learning. A unique aspect of, of LE Unified is that it has many configurations, for example, six to eight, K to six, K to 12. So it enables us, for example, to look at how sixth graders, what their um, outcomes and um, attendance and enrollment looks like if they're in those different con configurations. Next slide, please. Another example how we'll, how we'll look at that variation is, um, here's an example of looking at elementary students who have elected in-person learning um, as of the end of last year, um, based on the, um, the vaccination coverage rate within that, the geographic area where um, their school is located. And we can see um, certainly quite a bit of, um, of variation in terms of the average and also the dispersion uh, enables us to ask questions about why that might be. Um, so that helps us um, encourage insight. Next slide, please. Um, regarding parent safety concerns, we'll do that um, in two ways. One, by adding um, content to an annual uh, survey that's done, the school experience survey that surveys parents, staff, and students, um, and that will add some content related to COVID um, to that survey. And um, there's a fair amount of stratification, both by school, by um, by grade, and by other um, subgroup, including foster youth, um, that will come out of that. Um, and we will also be doing parent interviews um, to delve deeper into uh, specific um, issues that the parents have on an ongoing basis. Um, next slide, please. Um, the last part I wanted to mention is I, I had talked about the responsive health education and we did uh, partner with a, uh, a company that has a technology platform that enables um, information to be solicited regarding testimonials or experiences or parent perceptions that can then be shared both for um, qualitative um, assessment for thematic analysis, but also for immediate use in social media um, and other purposes. So we'll be using this platform to try to capture parent voices um, were in their own words, um, the huge diversity of voices and both using this as to um, mitigate some of the disinformation and also put um, positive message out, out testimonials about safety vaccination and other content that would have, will evolve um, as needed. Um, next slide, please. 
I'll just conclude by um, saying um, thank you again on behalf of our research team. And we look forward to collaborating with everyone involved in the Radix uh, Up initiative in phase one and phase two. Thank you so much. Thanks, Moira. And I also wanted to acknowledge that your um, PI, Dr. Mitchell Long, is also here today. So, so hi, Mitchell. It's good, good to see you. I do. Um, I look forward to the the interpretation, but also how you're going to disseminate the the wealth of data that you're going to have the ability to to look at. Um, you know, LA Unified is a is a quite a large school district, so I think the variation that you talked about will be quite interesting moving forward as schools decide what to do. So, thank you. Next slide, please. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Rebecca Lee from the Arizona State University. Rebecca. Hi. Hi. Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, yeah, there we go. Very good. Okay. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present a little bit about our work today. Uh, and thank you for the funding opportunity. And the project's full name is Back to ECE Safely. And I'm sorry, we've got the old slide, the Back to School Safely. Well, in concept, preschool. Reducing COVID-19 transmission in Hispanic and low-income preschoolers. We have shorthanded the name of the study to Be Sage. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Sage as we go on. I am a professor in the Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention in the Edson College of Nursing and Health Innovation at ASU. Next slide. Forgot I was not advancing that. Okay, so this is me. I am the professor. I told you about that. Wrote a book. Um, I have quite a lot of experience working with Mexican and Mexican American populations. Uh, having twice been a Fulbright Scholar to Mexico, uh, most recently right before the pandemic. Very interesting uh, work. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, if you want to contact me. Next slide. So a little bit of history about this line of work. So SAGE stands for Sustainability via Active Garden Education. And prior to my tenure in uh, Arizona State University, I was at the University of Houston for some time running a uh, university research center called the Texas Obesity Research Center. And while I was there, um, I obtained funding to develop a, a community collaborative and partnership to work on the problem of uh, obesity in our community with a transcultural focus. And by transcultural, we were trying to think of strategies we could use that would work well for anybody from any cultural background that weren't necessarily like a, a very super tailored for one ethnic group or one priority population. Uh, thank you. Um, so that, that collaborative, it was uh, two years we worked on this and our community came up with this notion that we, we really want to work with young children we want to use gardens in schools. And we understand that keeping kids very active is very important and also making sure that they're eating healthfully and learning about fruits and vegetables and, and how to be a good citizen and what science is and all of those good things. So we created this project. Then the next project, our R21, was again this collaborative to develop this intervention strategy. And thus emerged SAGE, which is a garden-based physical activity and behavioral nutrition program that is implemented in early care and nutrition, early care and education sites. Um, at our ECEs, uh, we use, um, we implement a garden. We have uh, very comprehensive materials for teachers um, and also lots of heavy engagement. Uh, with this end goal then of increasing physical activity, improving eating habits, physical activity at the early care and education site in our work in Houston, and also we've seen this in Phoenix, the kid, if you put an accelerometer on the kid and let the kid run around all day and do whatever the kid does, the place where the kid is the least active is at the early care and education site, which is a real problem because uh, this is a time um, during the ages three, four, and five when children are learning many important motor behavior uh, skills that if they do not learn then, they become very hard to learn later in life, as well as learning about hunger and fullness and other sorts of sensations that are happening in your body, which help you to uh, eat healthfully as your life goes on. So that grew out of that R21. 
Then uh, we are currently wrapping up uh, part of a U01. We're part of another family of trials in the U01 uh, to look at this uh, SAGE garden-based um, uh, curriculum. Next slide. So up comes the RADx UP. So we were very happy to apply for this award. And so our study team then involves people who are researchers on the original SAGE family of studies over the years, um, as well as people who are involved with our uh, testing and have another, we have another RADxUP study at ASU that is involved in reducing testing deserts uh, throughout Arizona and access to uh, testing. Um, and then we also have partners in our community. And you can see we have, uh, it's, it sort of seems like a cast of thousands compared to some of the teams we've seen. But uh, we have uh, yeah, the physical activity, the nutrition, as you would suspect from our SAGE study, but then we also have a very heavy emphasis on biostatistics and data management, um, heavy emphasis on cultural embeddedness, um, as well as our team that we culled from our other study that have helped us with the testing and learning about how do you test people and children effectively for the COVID. Our community partners then, we also have a partnership with Phoenix Children's Hospital and uh, Equality Health Foundation, which helps us by supplying us with trained uh, community health workers uh, who help with our outreach. So next slide, please. All right, so uh, our research questions are here. Um, this study then is looking at testing young children aged three to five year olds using an innovative protocol that we have developed to use a parent coaching method um, as part of a back to school screening strategy. And so we're trying to figure out, can you do this? Is it acceptable? Is it possible? Is it feasible? Does it work? Can you get the right amount of saliva that you need in the vial without too many bubbles? And does that uh, sample then stay good getting it to the lab? We've had very good effects results with this test. Uh, so I think that probably that will be just fine. Um, but since we haven't done this with three to five year olds, we need to check on that. Um, we also uh, are proposing to test our early care and education personnel, our teachers and aides. These are people who have not been vaccinated. We don't, um, it was really interesting listening to the California presentation, UCLA, because in Arizona, we don't have nearly as detailed data collection going on. So we don't have really any information on who is, is a lot, not too much on who is vaccinated and people uh, in teachers and aides. Um, and so determining if there is an additive efficacy, if you screen the kids and the teachers, will you have better attendance? Will you be able to detect cases sooner? Um, and and will that make a difference? Uh, we also wanted to know then, um, how do we address this education gap that has occurred? And I was telling you a little bit earlier about how young children are learning lots of important things, particularly our kids from underserved populations. If they don't go to the early care and education site, they really are missing out on lots of opportunities to learn, not just sort of the academic -y things like numeracy and and letters and numbers and um, those kinds of important skills, but also the, the other motor developmental skills um, and other kinds of socialization, which is really important. So this education gap, we believe is happening more strongly in our underserved populations. Our early care and education sites are all sites that are CACFP eligible. So many of them are Head Starts. Um, or otherwise linked to public schools or sometimes private early care and education centers, but they predominantly serve Hispanic and Latino populations. About, I think something like almost 80% of our kids in our SAGE trial uh, have been Hispanic or Latino. Um, so we want to know, can we then uh, improve our outdoor education time, reduce transmission, improve attendance by using this outdoor education opportunity around a garden, as well as improve these motor development and uh, reduce eating in the absence of hunger. So kids learn those important skills. So next slide. Oh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this test because we were, uh, I guess it is not well known that we have a saliva test at ASU. So our saliva test is just great. 
Uh, ASU invented the saliva test last summer. Our Biodesign Institute folks changed everything around in their Biodesign Institute to develop this test that works very nicely. It's much more accurate than the swab test because you get quite a larger volume of saliva, as you can see in the little vial there. Um, and you just spit into the vial and then the sample is uh, securely transported and the test is done. Uh, at ASU, uh, this was developed initially because our athletes, we wanted to have our student athletics back on track because you know, it's a big money maker for the university, very important to have college athletics. And our athletes were refusing swab tests. So we had to find another test that would work. So it's, it's interesting how innovation happens, right? Um, so with uh, this test is FDA approved for anyone at any age. However, we've had a lot of trouble, I think really just not willingness to try uh, to teach kids how to use this, but it's above the age of three, they're able to do it in our pilot tests. And they seem to think it's very funny, fun, funny, spitting into the straw. So there you go. Next slide. So Sage, I told you a little bit about this, just some pictures so you can get a better feel for it. Sustainability via active garden education. And uh, this is, you can see there's a kid-sized garden so kids can reach the garden. These pictures are obviously before the pandemic because no one is wearing masks in them. But we have lots of garden-based uh, activities, garden-based games, songs. It seems like it's really fun, a lot more fun than a lot of people have been having, I think, in the last year, for sure. So schools are very excited about this. Um, our, our ECEs, I think are concerned in some cases, teachers are very excited about doing back to school testing. However, um, they are, our teachers, we've been doing uh, focus groups over the summer with our teachers and our teachers are telling us that they're worried that parents may be reluctant or scared because you're testing a kid or that it's invasive. So having this garden-based curriculum as part of a comprehensive strategy to reduce transmission, open air, learning as well as testing and our CDC recommended strategies of wearing masks and distancing and hand washing seems to be um, a more appealing sell to our sites. Next slide. So we have put forward a possible timeline. We know with the OT and the way this is a very fast moving situation with the coronavirus, uh, Everything is very wiggly, but we are right now working on getting our sites in place to do child saliva testing along with one parent who does the parent coaching at the sites for 40 sites, um, as well as doing teacher testing at 20 sites, half of the sites. We have a very elaborate cluster randomized control trial design that I can tell you about another time, but we don't have to talk about that right now. Um, at our sites, uh, we uh, anticipate that there may be positive tests and those we arrange for our community health workers to follow up with um, using, a, using a wonderfully well-established protocol from our previous uh, studies that have been done using our colleagues that are also uh, participating in this. And then in the fall, later in the fall, we install gardens or freshen up the ones that have been let go during the pandemic and uh, look at these issues related to motor development and eating in the absence of hunger and measure changes over the school year. Um, in Arizona, the growing season is the opposite of many other places in the, in the US where uh, our growing season happens in the fall, winter and spring as opposed to not much is going on right now, it's too hot. Okay, next slide. Oh yes, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. At least two takeaways that, that I always appreciate from your from our discussions is one, kids under the age of five like to spit. They just need to work on their aim a little bit. And that two, you know, our educational settings really provide um, uh, more than just uh, academic education, but I think the ability to really investigate nutrition, physical development, motor development, um, and as you mentioned, socialization and mental health are such important factors for our, for our kids. So really looking forward to, to your project. So thank you. Um, next slide, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Russell McCullough from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Russell. Great, 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this project and for the opportunity to conduct it. Our project has a long title. Um, uh, it's Mobile Health Targeted SARS-CoV-2 Testing and Community Interventions to Maximize Migrant Children's School Attendance During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Next slide. Our team, this is not our entire team, but on the top left and the top right uh, is uh, me and uh, my co-PI, Dr. Yana Broadhurst, uh, who, uh, and uh, a lot of team members in the middle here that uh, represent a uh, combination of um, two uh, projects that had been going on since the, the beginning of the pandemic um, and uh, that we're excited uh, to put together for the benefit of children who, in uh, our part of the country are exceptionally at risk with uh, quite a few hits to accessibility to testing and to uh, aid and resources uh, to enable them to overcome challenges that the pandemic um, uh, has imposed upon them. Um, next slide, please. Our general project uh, overview, what we're looking to do is hopefully enroll uh, approximately uh, 800 total participants um, in an integrated screening and SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, testing program. The, uh, the source of our, our patients is going to be um, the, from the uh, Nebraska Migrant uh, Education Program. And uh, this will include approximately 400 students, uh, which can range uh, in age from uh, uh, pre-K up through uh, high school um, and early post-secondary uh, age uh, and their caregivers because our unit of uh, engagement is actually at uh, the household level um, for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about here. What we're uh, uh, going to be doing is combining two uh, programs that we have uh, employed in public school systems across uh, urban uh, uh, areas in Nebraska, particularly in the uh, Omaha uh, metro area um, where Dr. Broadhurst worked uh, with uh, doing uh, symptom, uh, excuse me, uh, salivary uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing uh, in the Omaha Public School District. Uh, and my team and I uh, developed and deployed uh, a uh, mobile health tool uh, that was deployed uh, via mobile devices for uh, household level symptom and exposure screening and also screening for social determinants of health uh, risk factors with connection to community navigation. Um, the, with those, uh, those screens, uh, positive screens are going to be recommended to perform at home uh, salivary SARS-CoV-2 testing, and uh, which uh, those screens are, were, are, are going to uh, work to achieve a goal of uh, daily screening if we can, and uh, weekly social determinants of health screening, um, which uh, uh, we, uh, uh, with positive screens that are then connected to community navigator uh, services. And then based on our, our population, which I'll talk uh, more about here in a moment, a lot of what we're focusing on is asking why you would or would not do uh, uh, things uh, in, in the program. What, what uh, uh, contributes towards your engagement um, with uh, the health systems, with community aid and resources, and what uh, um, either uh, leads you at, uh, and your household to not uh, choose those services or uh, what factors uh, inhibit you from uh, engaging in those resources. And the thought is uh, that with our work focused on uh, uh, my, the migrant education program, which serves approximately 220,000 students across the country, that we may be able to uh, uh, show how a, uh, a program that is, that is also mobile can uh, match the needs of uh, a population that by its very definition is and must be mobile in order for them to uh, engage in uh, uh, their, uh, their daily lives, their, uh, their uh, caregivers' jobs, those, um, those sort of activities. Uh, next slide. So our questions that we're looking to answer in this project uh, include, what is the feasibility of mHealth targeted uh, at-home salivary testing among migrant children and their families? What's the impact of that salivary testing, both directly related to case finding, but also uh, uh, effects on uh, school attendance and ripple effects related to uh, things uh, like uh, job security for uh, the, uh, the caregivers, 
um, for uh, uh, child care responsibilities, uh, uh, other resource use. Uh, what's the feasibility of screening and response for socioeconomic challenges among migrant households? And what's the impact of targeted public aid and community assistance uh, among uh, migrant families reporting needs? Um, and which we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about here in a moment. Uh, and then what, uh, in, on more of the, uh, the qualitative aspects, what are the socioeconomic, socioeconomic challenges that are negatively impacting the ability and willingness of migrant families to safeguard their health and well-being during COVID-19? And what changes uh, do migrant families believe are necessary to enhance their ability and willingness to safeguard their health and well-being during COVID-19 and similar future events? I will say that the project that we have uh, proposed uh, in the, this uh, program uh, has uh, already gone through several changes reflecting uh, extensive community consultation um, with uh, our, uh, our colleagues and from migrant families in uh, central Nebraska. And what we had uh, initially conceptualized at the beginning is very, very different than uh, what we have now. And I think that last question is really critical that how, how to adapt um, and how to, and, and listening to um, what the needs are as opposed to proposing the solution, I think is really, really critical. Uh, next slide, please. Let me tell you a little bit about the Nebraska Migrant Education Program. This infographic gives you a lot of info, but if you start uh, in uh, the uh, basically the top middle there, you can see that of our approximately 5,000 students that are in Nebraska who are enrolled in the Nebraska Migrant Education Program, which for those of you who don't know, um, if you could go back one slide, if for those of you who don't know, the um, the Migrant Education Program is a federally funded program that is administered uh, via block grant to the states who then send out the, uh, distribute the money out to uh, educational organizations um, throughout the state. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about um, how uh, Nebraska uh, divides theirs out. But for our uh, 5,000 uh, students um, who are identified through direct uh, recruitment enrollment, this is you know, folks beating the streets and talking to community members and identifying families and those students. Uh, the vast majority of our, our, uh, our uh, families uh, and students are Hispanic, um, but there's more than 50 languages uh, spoken by the uh, students who are enrolled in the uh, migrant education program. 100% are uh, eligible for free lunch, full stop. So highly vulnerable on food security. Um, and uh, ha almost half have uh, limited e uh, English proficiency, right? So significant uh, language barriers meet. I always try to think of this as my barrier to speaking effectively to them, not their barrier speaking effectively to me. Um, and uh, you can see here in terms of our uh, at-risk student population, pretty significant. And then graduation rate, which is the, one of the metrics of success for the migrant education program uh, for Nebraska, that's about 79%. So certainly some um, a, lot, a lot of good there, but also um, a, a significant opportunity to continue to improve. Next slide, please. As I said, the program is actually a federally funded program that's administered uh, state to state. For the state of Nebraska, it is administered through a combination of school districts and education service units. Um, and, uh, and services are provided um, through uh, the uh, uh, the, the migrant education workers themselves are employees of uh, their, those respective organizations. So think of, you know, everybody has a concept of a school district, an educational service unit uh, for a state like Nebraska um, often provides administrative and or fiduciary assistance to uh, a group of school districts in a geographic region. Um, and, uh, and so I've highlighted uh, three counties um, where, uh, that, that are the home for one of the school districts uh, where uh, the uh, migrant education program uh, is, uh, we're partnering with uh, uh, in Kearney, Nebraska, uh, where they've got about 200 uh, children. And then we have another uh, 600 or so um, in two other counties that comprise uh, part of education service unit nine. Um, although we would likely be looking at families throughout that central region. Um, and two things that I want uh, you to see here. One is that our families are all over the state. And the two is that, it, that it's a very balkanized system, right? So if you do a, uh, a school district-based process, you're really not capturing necessarily the communities uh, for these migrant families. They're, they're kind of squirreled away um, into wherever, uh, wherever they're working. Um, and uh, the migrant education program tries to be one of those unifying systems to bring them 
uh, together uh, and and address needs uh, with a with a focus on them uh, themselves. So agri, you know, uh, which is I, I think is uh, is a huge challenge um, uh, given the geographic spread. Next slide. Our testing approach, just briefly, um, is. Um, through the uh, M Health program uh, for the daily screening, if there's a risk for infection, which is identified either via epidemiologic risk or uh, symptom screening at the household level, um, so anybody who in the household, if there's nothing there, uh, they're advised to attend school or work. If they, if there is a concern, um, then they are advised to. Uh, they're asked if they're willing to test. If they're not, we circle back uh, with the the families to uh, uh, conduct uh, qualitative uh, uh, interviews to understand the barriers and facilitators uh, to uh, participation in the at-home testing. Um, if they do agree to it, uh, they have um, at-home testing supplies which are already uh, delivered to uh, their home that they can use and then mail uh, overnight to um, our, uh, our testing uh, facilities in Omaha, Nebraska. If they're positive, uh, we uh, alert the, uh, uh, the family and uh, it go through the regular health department reporting and contact tracing uh, apparatus alerting them. Um, if it's not, we uh, also alert and uh, educate them. And in talking with our families, one of the big issues is uh, availability of testing in rural areas is extremely limited and availability and understanding of where that testing is, how that, that's communicated to families who don't speak English in rural areas is even more limited. Uh, and so the thought is with our, our M health based approach, which um, allows us to create uh, tools that are uh, in uh, uh, specific in different languages um, and to uh, adjust to cultural context uh, that we will um, be able to get that information uh, to them to at least help remove part of that barrier to uh, uh, decision support and testing. Next slide. On the social determinants of health side, um, we uh, uh, have in that same app, they uh, can, uh, they would select the uh, household challenges screen. Uh, which uh, is based off of the FinEx measures and uh, has 14 questions uh, included in that. Uh, if there are no challenges identified, uh, they're thanked for uh, screening and there's a list of local resources tailored to uh, their community. Um, and if there uh, are challenges identified, um, that then asked if they are have requested or are receiving assistance uh, or for those challenges. Um, regardless of the answer, uh, we ask if they would like further assistance. If they uh, uh, indicate that they would, um, their information is pushed to a community services navigator who's based in central Nebraska, who then connects them to the community resources and aid necessary to address uh, that challenge. Um, next slide. The reason I'm bringing up this complicated slide is for the blue, teal, and green uh, uh, boxes right there. So you can look at where all the data is flowing and all sorts of exciting places. What I, the reason I bring up those is because because we're using an M Health tool, we are able to, and, and because of the data integration that we have, uh, we are using Power BI, which is a software platform that can take that uh, the data and create. Um, dashboards that can be updated in real time and pushed out to different stakeholders. One of them is our, our partners in the migrant education program. One can be to the family navigator dashboard. Uh, another can be to our test coordinator. So we, are, we can look at things like the geography and the symptoms uh, and exposures that contributed towards test recommendations, in addition to pushing information out uh, to the RADx up. Uh, repository. And so those those data dashboards can empower uh, those uh, um, different uh, personnel to um, uh, make the best decisions on a day-to-day -day basis uh, for families who are participating in the program. Next slide. How we uh, address the program, uh, this is a collaboration with multiple school organizations that serve exceptionally at-risk communities that speak various languages. I'm sure everybody remembers from last spring uh, the uh, negative consequences of the uh, pandemic that we're hitting uh, folks who work in meatpacking plants and other agricultural uh, uh, area sectors of the country. Uh, this is a direct extension of work that has been done through uh, an IDEA funded uh, program. I'm the uh, director for the IDEA States Pediatric Clinical Trials Network site in Nebraska. And this builds off of community engagement work that we have been doing as part of our rural engagement plan for that program. So it's, it's a, a, a good synergy of uh, other NIH dollars. Um, it's an implementation testing strategy that really combines work that we've done in uh, school districts in urban areas already. Um, and uh, 
has, I think, the potential if it works um, and uh, to uh, scale to other programs, other migrant education uh, programs in uh, other states uh, and communities nationally. Next slide. Okay, and then our, a little bit on our engagement plans here. I think I'm about out of time, so uh, I'll let you review that. Um, we've already done quite a bit of community consultation and um, we're looking forward to uh, the additional uh, feedback and work with uh, families and our community partners uh, to uh, optimize our implementation um, here in the fall. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. McCullough. I, I so appreciate that you're meeting your your families and communities where where they're at, both literally and, and figuratively. So so thank you for emphasizing that. So next slide, please. I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. May Okihiro um, uh, for her presentation from the University of Hawaii at Monoa. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having us. We're really excited to be here and and really to be part of this great network. Um, okay, so we call our, our um, study Empowering Schools as Community Assets to Mitigate the Adverse Impacts of COVID-19. Um, and this study is a partnership between the University of Hawaii at Manoa on uh, Oahu um, and our five different um, uh, community health centers across the islands. Okay, next slide. So we call ourselves PAC or the Pacific Alliance Against COVID-19. Um, and this is our kind of motley crew of lead investigators um, from tallest to shortest. Uh, Dr. Ruben Juarez um, is our data expert and economist. Dr. Alika Maunakea is our epigeneticist and testing lead who grew up in the Waianae um, community, which is our main research site. And I'm the short one, May Okihiro. I'm a community researcher and longtime pediatrician at the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center, um, which is again, our largest uh, research community health center. Um, next slide. And so we've been working over the last year um, with our um, initial uh, RADx funding um, to address um, the health disparities associated with COVID-19. Um, that started right, right away back in February and March with our most vulnerable communities. Those who live in poverty in Hawaii, our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander and Filipino community members. And so this graph highlights um, some of those statistics um, coming from this um, the summary from this week. And you can see here the top three rows. So Pacific Islanders have really um, endured the, the greatest disparities. Um, they make up 4% uh, of the population. Um, most of these are from uh, the islands of Micronesia um, and Samoa, um, but they have um, made up 19% of all the cases in Hawaii and 21% of all the deaths. Filipinos um, have also um, endured um, um, health disparities um, from COVID. So while they make up 16% of the population, they've made up 20% of the cases and 23% of the deaths. And then Native Hawaiians um, community members did uh, fairly well in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, initially for, the, for much of last year, um, they made up about 13 to 14% of the cases, but that um, those case numbers have gone way up this last several months. And now um, they make up 21% of the cases and 13% of the deaths. Um, okay, next slide. So the COVID vaccination rates in Hawaii tell us that this vulnerability will continue. Overall, Hawaii is doing pretty well with about 59% of people fully vaccinated. Um, that's from this week. But vaccination rates among Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, you can see um, on the third group over, have been very low. And so while together Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders make up 25% of the population, only they make up only 17% of those who have been um, vaccinated. So it's, or 17% have been vaccinated. So that's, that's not good. Um, and in the upper corner, this um, pop-out graph shows that um, 
the um, it's actually the native Hawaiians who have had a lower rate of vaccination um, than the Pacific Islanders. So we're very concerned about that. Okay, next slide. So we also know that um, the vaccination rates differ by community. Um, and here in these graphs, the darker shaded communities have the highest rates of vaccination. Um, and so the communities that we're serving, this one with the red circle around it, um, is the, are the Waianae Coast communities where our health center is at. Um, and they have amongst the lowest rates of vaccination, despite many, many efforts um, to do vaccine events and vaccine clinics around the community. Um, and so we're really worried about the next, the coming months. Okay, next slide. So building off our initial RADx um, up grant, we are continuing our work with what we call the Aharo Health Centers, um, which serve uh, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and Filipino community members across the islands. The largest here in the upper left-hand corner, number one, is the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center, um, where I work. Um, and it's the largest federally qualified community health center. Um, and I've been a pediatrician there for over 20 years. We've got a, a well-developed research department. Um, and th this is where our um, initial um, pilot studies have been done. Um, the other Aharo community health centers um, have been working with Wainai Comp for many years. So number two is Waimanalo Health Center on the northeast corner of Oahu. Um, number three is the Molokai Ohana Community Health Center, um, serving the tiny island of Molokai. Number four is Honoka'a Kohala Health Center on the Big Island or Hawaii, Hawaii Island. And number five is Bay Clinic Health Center, which serves the communities of Hilo and um, the, the eastern portion of, um, the, of Hawaii Island. Um, and together, these five health centers um, form um, this really uh, great infrastructure to serve vulnerable communities in Hawaii and for us to be working with for this, these research projects. Okay, the next, next slide. So um, over the last year, while Hawaii has had some of the lowest rates, um, case rates of COVID-19 across the nation, we unfortunately have had amongst um, the least in-person learning for our public schools from elementary to high schools. And so in this, um, this tracker called the, I didn't know about this, but the, we found it, the Burpio's K-12 school opening tracker. They look at um, in-person learning across um, the country and the darker colors have higher in-person learning. And Hawaii, unfortunately, is a very light color and is number 45 out of the 50 states in the number of in-person days over the last year, um, which is quite unfortunate, again, because our case rates have been low, but our, our state has been very conservative in allowing in-person learning. And so we hope to be able to address that. Next slide. So really from, from the very beginning of our funding from last year, schools have been a major focus for us, especially also as a, as a pediatrician, we have seen the, the huge impact um, on our kids um, from school failure, um, huge amounts of, huge portions of, of students um, really failing school, um, all the way to the very high numbers of kids who now have um, marked anxiety, depression, um, and other mental health problems associated with the pandemic. And so we've developed a pilot program in partnership with the Hawaii Department of Health, um, targeting schools uh, using rapid antigen tests. And we tried several different platforms, but for many reasons settled on uh, the Binex Now. Okay, next slide. And so we um, uh, launched this pilot program um, this March with um, a large charter school called Kamile Academy um, that we um, is in our catchment area of our health center. Um, and for the pilot program, we focused on adults, but now we're gonna we're enrolling um, kids um, from 12 years on up. 
Um, they provide consent and assent, um, do a survey with many of with the common data elements, um, an antibody um, a serology test, and then the rapid antigen uh, in on their first visit. Okay, next slide. And in our um, workflow, if there is a positive antigen test, we do a confirmatory PCR test um, that we um, run up to the health center to do, um, advise them that they must, the uh, participant must quarantine, and then we try to get the results back to them in a couple of days. We really have tried within 24 hours, actually. Um, and then we've focused on once a week testing, um, but um, provided that we would do more um, if more often as needed. So if there was an outbreak. Um, and then the results are all um, uploaded into our Qualtrics database that Dr. Juarez manages. Um, and then we're looking at many different outcomes, but um, the effectiveness of the program. Um, but we're also looking at um, the percent um, who become vaccinated during the program and the costs. And what we found is that um, for nine weeks, we were there for nine weeks straight um, uh, at the end of this past school year. And um, our team really got to know the school um, personnel and really had these short little conversations with them as they went through the testing. Some of them were just a sentence or two. But what we found was that um, uh, many of them talk, many of the staff and teachers talked to our staff about about uh, vaccinations and about testing and about COVID in the community. And we had several go, go on to get vaccinated um, as a, you know, they, were, they didn't wanna be vulnerable anymore. Um, and uh, they, they've found that the information we provided was helpful. Okay, next slide. So this is part of our study team, and um, we have really emphasized bringing on community members um, and training them to become part of the, the study team. And so um, Aaron on the left and Blaine on the far right are from the community um, and have been le the leads in implementing our study. And then in the middle are um, Braden and Raphael, who are part of um, Alika's um, lab and have been coming out weekly to train um, community members in COVID testing protocols uh, and um, really helping getting the work done. And so um, it's been a really fun experience to, to, to get the academic and community teams to be working together really well. Okay, next slide. So, um, these are just some of our, our results. Over 80% of the teachers and staff participated in this voluntary pilot program with, with uh, well, well more than half of them coming more than once and many of them coming every week. 61% um, of participants reported feeling safer at school because of the testing program and 51% reported more likely to become be, being vaccinated um, because of the program. Next slide. 82% um, said they're more likely to get tested next time when they show symptoms. And I should say that many of the people, many of the participants were initially super hesitant to get tested um, and would come and, and, and we had people looking in in the doors and then leaving. Um, and once they got their first test, they came back. So that was really great. 87% said they would refer fa other family members to a similar testing program. And so now we're opening the testing up to uh, students um, and also to family and community members. And so this teacher said, um, it's a preventative measure. We can come engage how we are doing in our own communities and with our own families. Are we really keeping safe? Um, it's a good way to monitor and that's why I keep doing it. Okay, next, next slide. And so this is a picture of the principal, Paul Kepka, who's really been great to work with. Um, he's, he has enabled us to flex and, and have access to his staff and, and teachers. And so this is just a quote from him. He said, the data helps us make decisions so students can keep safe and focus on learning. The staff feel comfortable so they can also focus on learning. 
um, and we're going we're definitely continuing um, through the next year. Next slide. So from that pilot program, we are de we've developed um, what we call the school Ohana bubble toolkit. Ohana is family, um, and this is to disseminate disseminate the lessons learned. Um, and the plan is for other community health centers to then take this community, this uh, toolkit and um, implement it in their communities. So the contacts include um, the training equipment and the lists of equipment and supplies and how to get those um, agreements with schools and how to get MOUs in place, procedures and policies and um, various implementation checklists. Next slide. And so um, for this next um, uh, set of funding, um, we are going to be uh, working again with the Aharo partners and each site will work with their school complexes. Um, I should say that Hawaii is unusual, like many, uh, uh, well, is unusual in that our state has only one giant school system. So we are DOE, public school system serves almost 200,000 kids across the island. So it is a humongous bureaucracy that's hard to move. And, um, and, and so having the sites work with their school, school complexes are gonna be important, but we've also had buy-in from the, the top of this giant DOE, which has been great. Um, and so we're gonna be starting with weekly testing. Um, it'll be a tiered system um, that will, will be determined by um, what's going on in the community. Um, so we're working weekly with DOH on how frequently we should be testing. Um, and as the rates may go up, while they are going up, then we may need to increase the testing frequency. Okay, next slide. Um, and then the last thing is, as we develop this program with the community health centers, their CEOs really wanted to create a pipeline of learning for community members, but also wanted, were worried about how to develop a, a large, um, expand the healthcare infrastructure to do the testing. Um, because as many communities across the, the country were having <clears throat> problems getting employees um, for positions such as medical assistance. And so um, we, as part of this, are working to develop a certification. Um, uh, certificate for high school students and a curriculum where the high school students who are interested in health careers can learn about research, learn about COVID-19 and um, uh, how, how we um, do research uh, in the community. Um, we're going to teach them about lab um, procedures and testing procedures and then and get them on board to help with um, our testing processes. Um, so that's all being developed um, now also. So um, we are well in the sprint right now, as everybody else is. Um, we have some testing events already coming up in the next few weeks, um, and we're really excited to move forward. Um, next slide. So I think that that's it. This is a picture of our community. That's our health center on the side where I've worked for many years. Um, and uh, um, we're happy to be in touch with all of you. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, May. And, and again, I wanted to acknowledge that you also have um, a fellow members from your, from your team on, on the Zoom. So really nice to see the natural progression of your work from your pilot stages and how responsive you are being to the Hawaiian community. So thank you. For those um, of us who are Keeping an eye on the clock, I'm not worried about time. I do want to be able to give the uh, due diligence to Dr. Warren Kibbe's presentation, and we will do. Uh, we will go a little bit over and have some time for question and answers at the end. So. Um, why don't we go ahead and advance to the next slide, and I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Beta Jean-Francois from the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, Beta, are you with us? I know she was having some internet issues. Can you um, hear me? Tell there me we go. Yes, can you hear me? Oh, we can hear wonderful. you. Oh, great. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to introduce um, 
Uh, I'm one of the uh, program officers who provide oversight and work with the wonderful coordinating center, uh, data coordinating center that's led by Dr. Warren Kibbe and his wonderful colleagues, um, uh, Giselle Corby-Smith, uh, Mickey Wolkowitz, um, and Susan Knox, just a stellar team who's accomplished so much. And I'll hand it over to Warren. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beta. Um, so uh, I do realize that we we are um, we have limited time, so I will go relatively quickly through this. Um, first, I, I just I want to say I, I'm 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 just awed by the the, the the science and the the impact that all of you are um, having in your communities um, with your children. I, every one of the slides was, was beautiful. Um, I I. It was a lot of fun for me to, to sit and watch. And, and I think that, that dovetails nicely into really the goal of the CDCC, which is to support all of your science and make sure that in fact, part of our role is to make sure that what you're doing really does get disseminated as broadly as possible. So it really changes care for all children across the US. Um, so, so first I want, as Beta already said, I wanna welcome you from um, the other two PIs of the CDCC, uh, Mickey Cohen Wolkowitz and Giselle Corby Smith, um, and it, it's it's my pleasure to be able to, to to welcome all of you. And of course, we have a big team of people behind us. You can see some of their smiling faces right here, um, and and some of them are on the call, and not not all of them are. Um, but what I do want to say is that all of you will be receiving an invitation to um, a, a kickoff for or with the CDCC um, sometime in the next week or so. And that that uh, that meeting for the, with the CDCC will be in the first week in August. So we're looking forward to getting a, a, an opportunity to really have a much deeper dive with, with all of you. Um, so, so just to take to the next slide. Just so you know how, um, actually, sorry, a slide after that, you already know this part, the Coordination of Data Collection Center. Um, you know, really our, our goals are to accelerate the community implementation that all of you are doing. And we try to make sure that we do that without creating a, a lot of extra burden. Um, but recognizing there's a course, a, there, there is a cost in coordinating across many different sites. And we, we recognize that our job's trying to help you minimize all that. Um, as I already mentioned, really a big part of what we do is this amplifying and disseminating what you all are doing um, and making sure again, that really does change practice, it changes uh, the, the uh, impact of COVID testing in, uh, in all of our uh, populations. Um, something else we do, which is really support data collection. It, I was really happy to hear um, many of the, 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 the buzzwords that I, I guess now as the, the data scientist on the, um, it, on the CDCC, it makes me happy to hear people talk about uh, the data collection instruments, mHealth, um, how you're going about that. Again, we're here to, to make sure that, that we do all that together and we, we, we make sure, again, the data you're collecting translates across uh, uh, across the whole country. Um, and, and of course, the last point is really to utilize the infrastructure that all of you are, are, are building to support different kinds of COVID-19 research. Um, so next slide. Um, just again, these things are so important. I, I won't do justice to them in, in the next couple minutes, but it, it really is that the communities that all of you are working in, the com communities that we work with are at the center of everything we do. Um, something else that's incredibly important is we, we recognize, particularly for the, the tribal nations, that data sovereignty is, is really important. But at the same time, it's building trust and it's building relationships and, and being able to use the data that all of you are generating um, in, in alignment with the intentions of the community and your intentions. Um, and, and that really goes into the, the, the um, support that we're offering for all of the teams. So all of you, um, 
I've mentioned the dissemination piece, um, but it's also about helping build strategic partnerships across the different Rad XL communities. So again, uh, with all of you coming on board, um, we now have a lot of projects. Um, we're, we're over 80 projects now. Um, so making sure that in fact, we, we create those abilities for partnership is, is part of what the CDC is doing. Um, and, and then again, have that broader impact through informing national policy and priorities. So um, next slide, please. So I, I don't actually like having an org chart here because one is it's focused on the CDCC um, where the really important part is at the bottom, that's all of you. Um, but, but what I do wanna emphasize is that for all of you, for each of the projects, there will be an impact team, a member who's really your interface with all of the infrastructure we have. And their job is really to translate what you need into the, the, the different components that we have inside the CDCC to make sure we, we can provide you with, um, with the appropriate kinds of services. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those in the next slide. Next slide. Um, so we're, we're organized really in, in a couple different ways. I'll talk about the, the cores very briefly here. We have the, the, the administration coordination team, which just makes sure that we really do communicate appropriately um, as much communication as we need. Um, worrying about things like the committees that we'll be asking all of you to serve on, um, that they're run appropriately and we, we have clear scope and, uh, um, and guidance for all of them. Um, those partnerships again, and the policies and procedures, and then making sure that in fact, we're evaluating both what the CDCC is providing to all of you and that we're having the kind of impact we, we expect and we need to have um, beyond the RADx up program. Um, we also have three additional cores, one focused on community engagement um, and it's best practices for community engagement. It sounds like all of you are really being very community focused and driven. You, you will be providing best practices to us. We won't be providing them to you. Um, but helping you build communities of practice, both amongst the, 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 the multiple return to school projects and the other projects that also are focused in schools. Um, and, and then there's other types of community practices as well. Uh, we have another core, which is focused on testing. Um, and, and that's really making sure that, in fact, all of you are aware of the latest um, EUA, so the emergency um, use authorizations that, that, are, that are in place and helping you, um, if you need any help, with defining and designing your protocols. Um, and then finally, the data science and statistics core, um, which we're, we're there to help you with the data harmonization, um, security and privacy of the data, thinking about how we, we exchange data, and importantly, how we get those data to NIH as well to be part of the, uh, the RADx data hub. And we'll talk more about that again um, in the future. So next slide. I, I just wanna talk very briefly about the engagement impact team. This is your um, contact and your venue into um, the CDCC. And again, as I mentioned, every one of the projects will have a, um, an EIT member and a, um, a project lead that is um, assigned to your projects. And they're really the way that you, you, you can access all kinds of things with um, um, inside the CDCC. And that's you know, everything from translation services that we offer um, and, and we can put you in contact with, with people who offer translation services um, to make, again, making sure that, uh, that, that uh, we're sharing those best practices. So we'll talk more about that in, uh, in, in a couple months here when we have the deeper dive. So next slide, please. Um, and then we have our communications. And again, you'll, you'll get your first um, contact with communications if you haven't already um, when we send out our, our weekly newsletter which which highlights activities across 
um, the consortium and, um, and, and, and take advantage of your EIPs and reach into the communications teams when, when you're crafting um, uh, messaging and, and branding for your different projects. And, and let us help also then disseminate those information, uh, that information more broadly. So um, that was a whirlwind of some of the things that the CDCC does. And it's great to meet all of you. I, again, I, I just loved the presentations and I think we're gonna turn over and uh, ask questions next. So Sonia. Thanks so much, Warren. I do appreciate the, the collaboration with the CDCC and the important role that, that you play with all the RADx UP projects, not just for the return to school program, but on, as a whole. So thanks again. So at this time, I do want to have some time, if you can hang on with us, um, take a little bit of a stretch to see if there are questions for any of the presenters um, amongst yourselves or from the audience as well. Um, and then did want to also share that all the um, slides and the recording of today's uh, kickoff webinar will be shared and posted on the RADx UP site soon. So um, if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and jump right in. Hey, Sonia, this is Ruben Juarez from Hawaii. Hi, Ruben. Um, I have a question about the collaboration with other teams. Like, how do you envision that to happen? Is that gonna be like a one-to-one, -one, like I contact uh, another team or are you guys gonna be providing some framework for that? So thanks Ruben for your question. So do you mean with the other investigative teams or do you mean with the CDCC or, or, the or both maybe? Yeah. No, with the CDCC, we got it, yeah. So uh, I can try to, address that and what we've been doing um, with the other projects is um, we are trying to build up these communities of practice and I think it makes sense for us to have communities of practice that are focused on some of the things that you're most interested in. Um, if that's if that's not what you meant then yeah I apologize um, but but certainly we'll try to help you establish some of those groups. We have uh, a number already in place and and either you could be joining some of them or we can create a new one. Yeah, and I think the other the only other thing to say is that we can also, I mean, obviously, if you want to reach out to any of the investigators that are involved in return to school, don't hesitate to do that. Um, and, and I will say the other thing is there are some of the investigators that are participating already that are formally teamed, meaning that they have a shared milestone. Um, and so, as you all know, in your negotiations, some of you have that and some of you don't. Um, if you don't, that's, you don't need to worry about it, um, but they are gonna try to achieve the same objectives. So there are some collaborations also um, as part of the negotiations that have happened. So don't ever hesitate. And if there's some things that we can help facilitate from our side, don't hesitate to reach to our team. All right, thank you. <clears throat> this is May Okihiro, also from Hawaii. Just following up on that, in terms of the common data elements that we may be using for, for the kids, for the adolescents who can do their own surveys, um, or parents, when might we anticipate that coming on? I know that you guys have a million things to do, but. So I can talk a little bit about that. Um... So we've been, been meeting with the, the first group of the return to school and they've been very busy um, creating a new set of CDEs focused on children. Um, that process isn't quite done yet. Actually, it's great because I think all of you can, can join in. Um, we'll, we'll be asking for um, volunteers to, to, to join that, uh, that group. Um, it's actually, it's a broader, um, childhood health working group, but the initial focus is really those CDEs. And as you're pointing out, we, we do need to get them finalized. Um, at the same time, there's, a, there's been a, 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 a second, I'll call it a second work stream um, that NICHD has been running, which is really focused on all the kinds of pediatric CDEs that might be necessary. Um, 
and, and that's a little bit broader than the ones that are going to be just for um, for Rad XL. But we're also trying to mesh those two activities together so that, that we end up with the best possible CDEs. So I don't have a date yet for you. Um, I apologize for that. I wish I did. Um, but it'd be great to get, again, uh, volunteers from all, all of you, your projects to be part of that working group. Thank yeah, you. And the broader NICHD effort is really to support not only this project, but we're also working on pediatric long COVID um, and so post acute sequela of COVID, as well as multi system inflammatory syndrome in children. So we're trying to sort of cover the range of diagnostic possibilities. Um, and uh, Dr. Bob, Robert Timboro is leading the effort with some of our folks, and that informs RADx overall, as well as some of the other sort of efforts that are tied to RADx. So I think um, you will see that evolve. But I think if you can for RADx UP at least, we can coalesce on on that. I think we're coordinating pretty well with the CDCC at this point on on that, and and so just know that those CDEs will be required, and we're trying to incorporate best we can. Other questions or thoughts, comments from, from anybody? Okay, I'm not I'm not seeing any. Um, um, but I, I did want to uh, before I before I ask Dr. Cernich to close, I did want to again extend my thanks to all the investigators for being so responsive in such a short timeline and really being ready. Um, uh, to, to engage with your schools and your communities. This is quite an important uh, effort as you as you are very well aware and uh, the commitment to the to the students and the kids and, and the communities that you're working with is um, just really amazing and impressive to, to be able to be a part of. So thank you so much for that. You know where to find us. So um, we will be uh, in closer contact now that we have um, uh, things underway and really look forward to uh, the next meeting and, and hearing from us and getting more progress updates. Um, so Dr. Cernich, I'll leave it to you to close the close today's meeting, please. Well, so thank you, um, Ms. Sonia. Um, you know, as she said, this has been a real journey uh, for both the NIH team, but I know for some of you as well. Um, and we have asked you to do very, you know, very fast turnarounds, very fast negotiations, quick proposal submissions, um, quick work to coordinate with teams. You're going to have some other new obligations that aren't routine in the grant world. Um, and so please stick with us and be patient. Um, if you have questions, ask them. Um, we've, we've done this now once, so we're like pros. Um, <laughs> but I think um, you know, we will ask you to indulge us a little bit. If you have a question we can't answer, we will absolutely find it out. Um, but I also just want to second, you know, um, I have two school age kids. Most of the team at NICHD has school age kids. This is not just professional, it's personal. Um, and we want to make sure our kids are safe. We want to make sure our school communities are safe. And we want to make sure that those who are benefiting are really those who may not be, ca you know, caught in, in regular efforts, right? Those kids that are overlooked, that are underserved, and you all are really bringing that community engagement to bear, um, and we really do appreciate it. So thank you for your commitment to that public health um, goal, and thank you again to the NIH leadership for all their support, because this has definitely been a journey. Um, so I will close, and thanks for sticking with us. Good luck, everybody, as you go to implement. Bye, everybody. Thank you.